Good afternoon. Uh, so I just wanted to echo some of the um, comments from earlier this morning. Um, Beelin had talked a lot about uh, providing narratives that are more nuanced, that aren't just about poverty. And I can tell you that you know poverty sells and sex sells even more. And to tell a story that's far more nuanced has been a journey that I've been on for the last 10 years that culminated in this book. So five years of research and five years of writing. Um, the book titled Dealing in Desire, Asian Ascendancy, Western Decline, and the Hidden Currencies of Global Sex Work. Um, and it's, it is a story of inequality because in, in many ways it involves studying up, which is studying very wealthy global elite men in finance, and studying down sex workers working in these industries. But it's not a story of poverty. It's a, story, it's a very different story of agency that pushes back against the trafficking literature. So I'm going to give you my whole book in 20 minutes. Um, and, and hope that you'll buy the book and get the, get the deeper nuance beyond this. But let me just start with the puzzle that motivated the main research question for my book. Because over the last 10 years, we've witnessed, um, is this on? Okay, oh, here we go. Over the last 10 years, we've witnessed dramatic changes in global financial flows that raise important questions about the simultaneous rise of East Asia and the waning economic dominance of the United States and Western Europe. So there are two processes that push us to rethink how people view hierarchies of nation that place the West at the top of the global order. The first is the global financial crisis that rocked the United States and Europe in 2008, and the second is the concurrent rise of East Asia. So according to this 2011 um, Merrill Lynch World Wealth Report, for the first time, there are now more millionaires in Asia than there are in Europe, which is probably not surprising to many of you in this room. But to Americans, to give more robust data, as of 2013, the World Bank reported that Asia's stock markets now account for 32% of global market capitalization, which is ahead of the US at 30% and Europe at 25%. So these broader economic shifts in global capital tell a revealing story that the developing world is becoming a driver of the global economy and as a result of this changing global economic order, new scholarship that examines the co-constitutive relationship between gender and global capital has to contend with these changes. So the book is oriented around this question. Sorry, it's not going. Uh, how do shifting global capital configurations destabilize the terms on which individuals negotiate their perceptions of this rise in Asia and the waning dominance of the West? And in particular, what I want to show is how the world of high finance is inextricably intertwined with relationships of intimacy on the ground. So to address this question, I'll first explain why you would turn to Vietnam to unpack these broader global processes. Within Vietnam, why look at the sex industry? outline this sort of conceptual framework and take you to the findings. So, why Vietnam? Iwa Am, David Harvey, Rem Kohlhaas, and many others have noted that nations like Japan and China alone can't contest Western economic dominance. What they argue is that this collective rise of multiple countries within a broader Pan-Asia that has destabilized Western hegemony for less developed countries in the region. So one way to understand the effects of this new pan-East Asian rise is to examine how people in less developed regions of the world, like Asia, uh, and like Cambodia or Vietnam, articulate their national ideals in relation to other countries in Asia and in relation to the West. So let me take you to Vietnam. After the fall of Saigon in 1975, Vietnam effectively closed its doors to the rest of the world. In 1986, after a decade of economic stagnation and lagging productivity, the Vietnamese government introduced a renovation policy called Noi Noi, effectively transitioning Vietnam from a socialist to a market-based economy, and at that time, attract, effectively attracting mostly Westerners and overseas Vietnamese tourists. But economic reform rapidly increased in 2006 after Vietnam joined the World Trade Organization, increasing the flow of foreign direct investment into the country. Vietnam became the second most attractive destination in, in Asia, trailing right behind China, for foreign investors seeking to underwrite some of the most ambitious projects in land development, trade, commodity manufacturing, and banking. So this was a country largely unaffected by the 2008 global economic slowdown since it's, um, since it's grown nearly 8% each year since it joined the WTO. 
So just to give you some numbers, the figure here shows the different flows of capital entering Vietnam between 2006 and 2010. The left bar shows the amount of overseas remittances brought into the country, and the right bar shows the dispersed foreign direct investment, so capital that's been actualized and registered through state banks. What you see here is that by 2010, um, the, the, the dispersed FDI was nearly three times the amount brought in in 2006. And when you include committed capital, or promised capital, what you see here is a spike in 2008, right at the height of the financial crisis, um, to 71 billion US dollars. So what is this indicative of? What this tells us is that there's been a rapid increase in the number of deals that were being brokered at the time, as well as this continued influx of overseas Vietnamese traveling into the nation. So one might ask, well, where is all of this money coming from? By 2009, Western nations played a much smaller role in Vietnam's market economy compared to countries like Taiwan, South Korea, Malaysia, Japan, Singapore, and Hong Kong. But foreign direct investments are not disembodied flows of capital. People, remit, people broker capital deals and remit money. And in Vietnam, foreign direct investment is embodied in entrepreneurial relations that are largely male-dominated and heavily, uh, heavily influenced by existing practices um, that rely in, in China, Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea, where men rely heavily on the sex industry to facilitate informal relationships of trust as foreign investors embed themselves in this local economy. So this is a picture from a chandelier in one of the bars that I worked in, not meant to be provocative, but actually meant to highlight the gender dynamics of deal brokering and why these informal economies matter. Um, to put it another way, in a country where the vast majority of investors don't have faith in legal contracts, or where they're looking to bypass many of the bureaucratic hoops to obtain land, licensing, and permits, the sex industry plays a vital role helping to establish important social contracts between state entrepreneurs with political capital looking to strike deals with private entrepreneurs and foreign investors. I witness this most often around the formation of speculative markets in real estate and urban renewal land development projects where men were brokering capital deals which involved a great deal of risk and reward. Here, the speculation is socialized through personal ties that shape markets and mitigate risk by making investors feel like they're getting off the books, unofficial knowledge of the economy. But a look at local Vietnamese elites and their Asian business partners brokering capital deals only tells half of the story, that of the rise of Asia. By strategically looking at multiple segments of the sex industry, the book also examines how Western businessmen, who also traverse this global cityscape, negotiate their perception of Western decline. So to give you this, the framework in, in looking, studying up and, and studying down, the book looks at how capital and women's labor co-constitute different kinds of masculine privilege. So in the high-end market, it's tied to Asian-based foreign direct investment that hinges on women's ability or sex workers' ability to embrace this pan-Asian ideal in order for the clients to claim Asian ascendancy. While in the lower-end market, it's tied to what I call benevolent remittances, and I'll get to that in a minute, that hinges on women's embodied labor to sexualize dependency or perform third-world poverty as these clients negotiate Western decline. So very briefly, um, I just, I don't have a lot of time and I have a whole methodological appendix, but I conducted um, ethnography over five years between 2006 and 2010. And in 2009 and 2010, I actually worked as a hostess in four different bars um, from two o'clock in the, or 12 o'clock in the afternoon until two o'clock in the morning, seven days a week, um, drinking, dancing, singing with the women, and, um, and then interviewing folks when business was slow. And in total, because it can get really boring after two weeks of, hi, how are you, you look sexy, all this stuff, I conducted 276 really um, interviews that, took, that lasted between two to seven hours. So let me take you to Kong Sao Bar, the highest end bar in Ho Chi Minh City. Oops. Here, the clients um, came from Vietnam's top finance, real estate, and trade companies and they were focused primarily on brokering trilateral deals between political elites, economic elites, and Asian investors. These men spent one to two thousand dollars per night on alcohol and tips, and they typically spent came in three to four nights a week, spending on average fifteen to twenty thousand dollars per month in the bar. The hostess workers who worked in this bar earned two thousand dollars a month just for tips 
accompanying men at their table singing, drinking, and dancing, and they typically made $150 to $200 for each sexual encounter. These men, who had access to FDI projects, actively worked to shift their place in the global imaginary by highlighting East Asia's ascendancy. Wealthy men like Anwa, for example, um, enacted their masculinity in relation to other men through male drinking rituals. So they only ordered Johnny Walker Blue, a bottle of whiskey worth $250, and they typically consumed four to eight bottles per night without ever asking to see the menu or inquire about prices. Blue Label enabled them to entertain their guests while simultaneously demonstrating that they're moneyed men. But these men were also critical of the failing credit economy in the United States and Europe, and they often used cash as a way to demonstrate confidence in Vietnam's market. So for example, at the end of one night of entertaining a group of South Korean investors who were um, doing a real estate deal, I watched as the bill came out and Ju Hai, one of the um, Vietnamese men, grabbed the check from the servicemen so that the Korean businessmen wouldn't have to pay for the bill. In less than four hours, the men burned through nearly $3,100 on alcohol and tips, but this was a bar that didn't accept credit cards. So he pulled out a wad of cash and instructed me to count out 42 million VND, or the equivalent of 2,100 US dollars, in front of everyone in the room to pay for the bill. Then, he handed me another crisp stack of these brand new 500,000 dong bills and instructed the women to line up. And as he tipped each one of them, he asked them, um, have you ever seen a white or Viet Gyu man tip like that? The Vietnamese men wanted local sex workers to understand that foreigners were passe and local clients were the uh, ones with all of the money now. But underpinning this scene are striking links to the broader political economy. Because Vietnam's dynamism in an Asian-centered economy depends heavily on South to South, and in this case, South Korea to Vietnam investment relations, as clients embrace an Asian-centered economy and work to attract foreign investments from Asia. When entertaining their Asian business partners, the sex workers play a crucial role helping to maintain these implicit hierarchies among the men at the table, particularly those who have political capital. So it's obvious, with you, the women clink their glass below a man's glass, but for older and more powerful men who have political capital, whose, whose signatures matter for licensing and permits, they clink their glass directly below the man's glass to signal to the investors what that hierarchy is among the men in the room. These clients also, these, these male clients also rely on the embodied labors of sex workers to symbolize modernity and progress, highlighting a pan-Asian ascendancy. So the workers have to construct new, distinctly non-Western ideals of beauty through what I call new technologies of embodiment. This bar had connections to two separate plastic surgery offices. These, so on Sundays, when business was slow, the plastic surgeons would come in uh, to the back door and give free nose consultations. <laughs> and this is an ad for one office that literally reads Korean rhinoplasty to differentiate itself from offices with doctors who are trained in the United States or Europe who might botch these women's noses and make them look undesirably Western. The clients rewarded women that they found aesthetically pleasing by inviting them to sit at their table. So for example, a few days after Yim had recovered from surgery, Guang, a 39-year-old client, points to her nose in front of everyone at the table and says, what do you think of her nose? She doesn't look like a poor country girl anymore, does she? Her nose is a sign of the nation's progress because it demonstrates that plastic surgery is no longer something that only the rich could afford, it's something that poor rural women who are now working in the sex industry could afford. And in fact, every woman that I worked with had these nose jobs because it was uh, gifted to them by many of the clients in the bars and they were only $250. So, so far I've outlined the ways in which local Vietnamese elites sort of um, claim Asian ascendancy. But let me take you to the bars catering to Western businessmen. Here, the guys can walk into a bar, order a $2 beer, and expect to have one or two women immediately greet them, serve them drinks, provide them with shoulder massages, hand them wet towels, the whole works. The workers in this bar typically earn two to $700 per month from paid sex, but they, their, their earnings were heavily subsidized with what I call benevolent remittances. So this is money that men give to the women that range anywhere from $300 to $50,000 to help them learn a morally respectable trade, to rebuild a village home, open their own business, or quote unquote, rescue them out of the sex industry. 
Here, most all of the men I met were expatriates who lived in Vietnam or traveled there frequently for business, but they were all men who, mo for the most part, lost their jobs after the financial crisis in 2008, mostly Lehman um, Brothers guys. <laughs> so I conducted several interviews with these businessmen who lost their jobs, and they often dis talked about feelings of inadequacy compared to um, eye bankers who worked for Goldman Sachs back in New York, London, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Singapore. So in a conversation with six expats, Daniel, a client in his mid-30s, says to me, the guys who are in Vietnam are here for the most part because they couldn't make it in New York, Hong Kong, or Shanghai. We're hoping that we'll get lucky in this market and, th and that this market is growing as fast as everyone predicted. So Bernard interrupts and he says, well, it's easier to go from being a banker in New York to any place in Asia, but it's really hard to go from Asia back to London or New York. The stock market here is tiny, and the fund that I manage is less than 2% of my company's overall investments. So over time, these conversations brought into question the dominant frameworks which assume that Western transnational businessmen dominate these local economies, local sex industries. These men lost their jobs amidst the financial crisis and credit crunch and were expressing a sense of failure about their work and marriageability back at home. Um, and so because of the d circulating narratives around trafficking, sex workers ca who cater to Western expats help them reinvent themselves by engaging in recreational and relational sex that was racially and class coded. These men were far more interested in imagining Vietnam as a poor third world country situated amongst burdened rice paddies. So the women developed various strategies to play into their clients' desires by performing third world poverty. They organized tours where men could visit fake families and villages that portrayed this authentic Vietnam, removed from signs of global change, modernization. Um, there, the men could ride, walk through rice fields, ride bicycles, and bargain in street markets. So following his return from the Mekong Delta, John, a man in his 40s, says to me, oh my gosh, there's so many things that we in the West take for granted, you know? Roofs over our head, hot water, and shoes. When I was with Nhi, I had to shower with buckets of cold water, and it was so disgusting because the bucket had a bunch of maggots in there, and I didn't realize that there were these tiny worms swimming around in my mouth that I had to spit it out. So then I asked them, how much would it cost to put in a proper shower head, and they said it was $500, so I gave it to them. And in fact, over time, he ended up giving them between twenty dollars to $30,000 to rebuild this village home. So you see these mansions next to these shacks, right? Um, this guy, unlike the portrayal of you know, disgusting Westerners who are looking to sleep with Asian women, actually believed these stories of poverty and genuinely wanted to help rescue these women from their horrible lives in the sex industry. So I just want to end um, here by saying that this study challenges ideas of Western dominance and the, and the ways that scholars have long thought about the co-production between gender and global capital. Western men negotiating Western decline are working to reproduce this map through their benevolent remittances, while local elites and their Asian partners, on the other hand, are trying to draw out new maps that contest Western superiority, that assert the ascendancy of not only Vietnam, but the broader East Asia. But it's only by looking at parallel markets where men negotiate these capital, new capital configurations that push us to reimagine global power hierarchies and the co-constitution between gender and global capital that both produces and depends on these kinds, these women's bodies which construct new hierarchies in everyday life. <laughs>